Now the financial people around tell me there's no money in, in, in making antibiotics. But that's okay, we're in academics. We're gonna kill these things because it's gonna wipe out humankind if we don't deal with it. So I'll tell you some of our work that we've been, we've been working on in our group on building molecular machines. And these molecular machines are actually much smaller than the biological machines that you, you've seen just that uh, uh, were presented to you. And um, uh, each one is a single molecule. So the machines you just saw are made up of billions and billions of molecules. These are made up of just one molecule. Uh, so let me take you through this. So what you see here is, is our, one of our nano cars that we've made. It has four wheels because we got into this for, from, from medicine first by building nano cars. It has four wheels. These are fullerenes. Each one of these is a fullerene. You can park 50,000 of these cars across the diameter of a human hair. So that's how small they are. Uh, you can see one, you, you, you can actually see one over here, Let me, and it's moving across this surface. Uh, this is on a surface of gold and striving across this surface. That was the first nano collision ever recorded <laughs> um, uh, when we built this car and had it move across this surface. And then um, we entered the, the, the first international nano car race was held in 2017 in France. We entered that race and you have to locate one of your cars on a surface and then drive it around this pylon, around this pylon, and then through these two gates. And this is a 10 nanometer bar, so we went 150 nanometers in 90 minutes. Now, that may not sound very fast, but the, the next group behind us was the Swiss group, came in five hours behind us. <laughs> and no other groups in the world were able to finish in the 30 hours of the race. And so then we published a paper on how to build and race a fast nano car. And the next race is going to be in 2022. And so the competition will be much rougher. But we were not allowed to use our fastest cars because our fastest cars have motors and they wouldn't let us use those. And so that you, we build these motors in mid chassis that spin. And uh, the, the reason they spin is you, you have this atrope isomerism, and when you excite these, this will go to an orthogonal arrangement, and you have a diastereomeric transition states where this can go one way or the other, and it keeps going over the lower energy side, which causes this to rotate unidirectionally. And uh, um, so we built these into the cars, but uh, uh, we, can't, we can't use these in the race right now, but they're much faster because the motors that we're building are based on a Faringa motor and they spin about three million rotations per second. So they're very fast. And so what we did is we now took these motors without the wheels and just used the motors with certain addends that will cause it to stick to the surface of a cell. And then with that on the surface of the cell, then we turn on the motor and it will drill holes into the membrane of a cell. And in doing that, you can throw off the proton gradients and kill the cell, or you can just use a little bit of them and have analytes, have certain drugs follow in behind them. And, and uh, uh, we can watch the cells die by doing this. We first studied this by building fluorescent probes on these molecules so that we can watch them as they diffused out of an artificial lipid bilayer. And then we did something called patch clamp where you where you have them interact with cells and you watch the current of the cell increase. So as you're opening up holes, now ions can flow through and that's going to change the, the, the current that's going into and out of the cell and you're, you're probing this with probes that are one probe inside the cell, the other outside, and you can watch these cells explode. And they explode because the ion gradients are thrown off. And, and so what we're doing here is we're working on PC3 cancer cells. This, this is a human prostate cancer cell. And what we do is we look at how fast can we kill them with the nanomachine versus controls, or how fast can we cause things like propidium iodide to diffuse into the cell and thereby kill the cell. Well, it's, what this is registering is whenever it interacts with DNA or RNA, it will intercalate and light up as red. And so this would be the way that we would introduce drugs into a certain cell by using actual nanomachines. This is not a chemical interaction. This is a mechanical interaction that is happening 
at the molecular scale. And because it's a mechanical interaction, it's very hard for a cell to deal with this. It's very hard for a cell to develop some resistance to this. If a cell can, can develop a resistance to a scalpel, then only then could it develop a resistance to this because this is a mechanical action, not a chemical action. And we put certain addends on the nanomachine now, and these addends are, are, uh, uh, are short peptides, uh, amino acid chains, that will recognize particular cell surfaces. And when they recognize the cell surface that, that you want, you have a, a particular cancer cell type, you can assay it, say what, what, uh, what is overexpressed on the surface, you target that particular cell type, and then have it go to that cell and kill the cell. We can even drill through skin. So this is one of our fast nanomachines <clears throat> where you can see how it's drilled down into the skin of this mouse versus the slow or just the solvent. And we can actually start drilling into the skin because what we'd like to do is, is start looking at melanoma, for example. Can we treat it in this way? Uh, we've developed other nanomachines that respond to two-photon near IR light. Two-photon is inherently confocal, meaning that it's a very sharp beam so that we can shoot over one cell. So both of these cells have nanomachines on their surface, but we can fire right across over the top of one cell and hit another cell, and that cell dies. That's because propidium iodide has filled that cell, and so we know it's dead. This cell is very much alive, and you see this blebbing where the cell is undergoing what's called necrosis. It just explodes. Normally, cells like to die by apoptosis, where they undergo a programmed cell death, and they start chopping up their DNA uh, before they release it. They'll chop up a lot of their peptides before they release it. But since we can cause the cells to just explode, they dump out their information, and now you can couple this with immunotherapy. This is an <clears throat> another way. What we did, we have three different cell types here. We have MCF7, which is a... There's, it, it's a breast cancer cell line, a prostate cell line, and a third cell line. And we can put all three of these in the same dish. Target one, and it doesn't kill the other two. Target the second, doesn't kill the first and the third. Target the third, and it doesn't kill the first and the second. We can have that sort of precision by putting the proper peptides on that will recognize just the specific cell of choice. The nanomachines will go to that cell stick there, and then boom, we turn them on, and they drill through and kill that cell. Uh, what we've done is we've started a collaboration now with MD Anderson. We started a company around this called Nanorobotics. One of my former postdocs uh, uh, is with that company now, and he's gone through actually the Discovery Institute program for one summer. He was, he was part of that. Um, and so when you look at, at, at uh, squamous cell and basal cell and, and melanocyte carcinomas, you can have the squamous cell carcinoma, which doesn't go very deep. Many, many people here may have had these cut off by dermatologists. The basal cell goes a little bit deeper. The melanoma can go very deep, and that's where it starts hitting the, the lymph system, and that's when it becomes really serious, where it spreads out. So can we start using the nanomachines where we just apply them here, shine a light, and have them go in and destroy these different cells that are on the surface? And we can look at all of these different cell types. And once you have the nanomachines, this is 100% viability. Only when you have the nanomachines with light, boom, they just kill, 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 kill. Everything dies. Very quickly, they cause cell death. Uh, you can have cells in a dish. You, you, uh, when, once you shine the light with the molecular nanomachines, everything dies. Everything dies. So, so it's very, they're very good. At, at going to a particular cell and just killing. And uh, uh, we've gone to in vivo models where we, we have these mice where they'll be injected with a tumor cell line, it'll grow, and then you inject the nanomachines and shine the light and you watch the tumor growth subside. The tumor goes away. The problem with this is we're using, we were first using ultraviolet light, then we design the nanomachines to work with visible light, but still visible light doesn't have deep enough penetration through human flesh. What we'd like to do is use near IR light. The problem with near IR light is it's much lower energy. Maybe when you were a kid, you might have, you put your 
your hand up to a, a, a lampshade and it looks red and you say, oh, there's the blood in there. And that's not the blood. What's happening is the near IR light is going through. So, so you're getting the infrared light and it appears red because it's the only light that gets through. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to redesign them and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But uh, we've coupling this also with immunotherapy because the idea is these cells die so quickly they spew out their proteins, and you can activate now the immune system to go after those proteins. So that's what we're using, because maybe the nanomachines didn't find some of the cells in the body, but now when you've activated the immune system to that particular cell type, then you allow the immune system to start going after those cells. So that's one of the things we're working toward. The other thing that we're working on is, is killing super bacteria. Now the financial people around tell me there's no money in, in, in making antibiotics. That's okay, we're in academics. We're gonna kill these things because it's gonna wipe out humankind if we don't deal with it. Uh, uh, there are these superbugs that are supposed to kill 10 million a year by the year 2050. So what I tell students is that when you are on my age, it's gonna look, COVID's gonna look like a walk in the park. Uh, if you get MRSA in, the, in a hospital right now, MRSA, I mean, it's, it's very hard to kill these things. And so there are nightmare bacteria on Earth today that we don't know how to deal with. Very, very deadly, can't control them. Uh, and then what happens is you can have a bunch of bacteria and then there happens to be one bacterium among them that is genetically resistant to your antibiotic. Then you go through a normal antibiotic regime, it knocks out all of these except the one that happens to be genetically resistant. And then that one that's genetically resistant starts multiplying, and all of a sudden you have a genetically resistant strain really hard to kill. That's why this is a big, big problem. It just happens to be resistant genetically, and then it starts, and what bacteria can do is they share DNA with each other. So you get a, and, and so it can even take bacteria that are not genetically resistant and they'll share their DNA with it, so now they become genetically resistant. So these are really sinister little creatures. There's a problem here is that there's a 35 year gap. Every FDA approved antibiotic used today is based on a scientific discovery from 1984 or, or earlier. And you say, why is that? Because there's no money in this. Because as soon as you develop a new drug, within about five years they've built up a resistance to it and the drug companies have not accrued back their money yet. So it's a big problem. Uh, and then when you look at bacteria, it doesn't just have a cell membrane. This is a gram-negative bacterium. You would have a, a membrane, then you have a peptidoglycan, which is an extra layer, and then another cell membrane, another membrane. So bacteria are really hard to kill versus like, like a human cell that would just have the one membrane. And, and this is a very difficult layer to get through. So can the nanomachines really drill through this? And so here is a bacterium. This is a super bacterium. It has just destroyed the cell wall here. It's called a cell wall, not even a membrane, but a wall. And they drill right through and they just, they just uh, make jello out of the innards of this thing. They go in and then what we found that we can do is we can just take a small amount of this and put it with outdated antibiotics which the cells normally don't respond to because they can no longer get through the cell membrane anymore. And we can take it with outdated antibiotics and turn the antibiotics back on. And uh, now they go flowing in. So we can drill some holes, let the antibiotics go in, or just use more nanomachine and just kill the cell by itself. The molecular nanomachines have exponential cell death. Uh, this is novobiosin. These are traditional antibiotics that are used today, and it shows how ineffective they are, these cell counts are not dying. We put in some of our nanomachines, these are logarithmic decreases. So this is a five log reduction in four minutes of just knocking out these cells. This is, this is exponential death of the cells, of these bacteria. These are super bacteria we're testing against. We also uh, go after what are called these persister cells, these cells that don't normally die. All of the traditional antibiotics are not touching these, our nanomachines, we have different nanomachines that can kill these exponential death. I mean, just, just large amounts of these. These are log reduction in bacterial death. The bacterium cannot build a resistance to this because it's a mechanical effect. It's like drilling a hole in it. It's not a chemical effect. 
They also destroy biofilms. Biofilms are really a, a real problem. If you have anything artificial inserted in your body, there are biofilms accumulating. And in those biofilms, bacteria are exchanging DNA material between them. Very hard to get through these. We can chop right into the biofilms. Um, we've gone after these highly resistant ones where we find the ones that are resistant, we just multiply the ones that are resistant. And then we, we treat these with the normal drugs, uh, tetracycline, germacin, it, and nothing is stopping these. They just continue to grow. We're baseline. Nothing is growing in these, not even this. These are our baselines right here. Everything is killing these. So even these persister cells, these bacteria, these can drill into them. Um, th this, is, this is what E. coli looks like. This is a normal E. coli. You can see it's undergo they're, you, where they're even undergoing cell division. This is what E. coli looks like after it's been exposed to the nanomachines. It's just filled with holes all over it. Very, very uncomfortable for these cells. They die quite rapidly. And, and so we disrupt these, these, these biofilms this way. But now what we're doing is we're going to these next generations that are going to be near IR active because if you can go 10 centimeters, 10 to 13 centimeters death pen penetration, you can hit any spot on a typical human body. You can just, just uh, uh, the light is from the outside, it just goes right on in. And we, total, we had to do a total redesign of the molecules and these are more jackhammer-like. Uh, but but uh, I think we're going to be successful in doing the same thing. So with that, this is a mechanical action, and I'll just wrap it up here. There's a company around this, and here's the folks that have done this. Um, everybody with a star, the different folks working in this. And uh, um, uh, this has been funded by the Discovery Institute. Had it not been for the Discovery Institute, this project would have died. You think, oh, NIH would love to fund this. Very hard to get funding for this type of thing. And uh, they kept it alive, and now we're getting more funding, and it's working out quite well. If you like the content that's coming out on this channel, I've not monetized it in the sense of advertising, but if you want to give and you want to help support it, you can give to a 501c3 so it's fully tax deductible, and you can see the link below. We'd love to have your participation, and there's several mechanisms by which you could give. Thank you.